So we've been talking about how life can change over long periods of time. Now, the idea, of course, is that all life comes from pre-existing life and that life descends with modification. Now, sometimes the change will be abrupt in what we call punctuated equilibrium. And that will happen because of really intense selection or really, really random events like genetic drift that will cause the population to suddenly shift to a certain look. But it can also happen slowly over long periods of time by separating two different populations and then successive small changes accumulated over long periods of time. Whichever way you look at it, evolution always works on changing what previously existed into different looks, which means it's going to be not perfect, but the best it could possibly be for the current environment considering what the environment was on previous generations. Now, this leads us to a great picture about how, what is evolution and how it actually works. So, it starts with genetic mutations or changes that occur in the organism. Changes such as mutations that change the genes, mutations that duplicate the genes and then change the, the copies, changes on transposition or the placement of pieces of the genetic code, changes in the interaction between genes or how the genes activate, changes in when the genes activate, which is the developmental changes, changes in the expression of the genes or the mechanisms that control the expression, such as cell communication and the protein synthesis factory. Then, when enough of those changes can occur, eventually those changes will start happening at the level where organisms are interacting with each other. So in other words, the population level. And then competition is going to happen within the population, selection, genetic drift, accumulation of mutations, uh, random events which make populations smaller, random, um, non-random mating, all the things we talked about in the macroevolution lecture series will lead to the evolution of populations. And then don't forget also that these populations will migrate to different locations and disperse. And in those different locations, they will be exposed to different environments. And those environments will also continue to change throughout time. Now, what that will eventually lead especially as those populations become isolated, and that's the red line you see on the screen there, as the populations become isolated from each other, either because of actual physical isolation or because of exploration of different niches or changes in the genetic code or chromosomes or behaviors or temporal or whatever other kinds of separation we talked about will lead to differential um, evolution on two different populations, which we call vicariance. Now, th that will actually lead to independent evolution. Now, later, maybe the populations will interact again. And then you're going to get those things like reinforcement, fusion, or stability that we talked about. But as historical constraints and developmental constraints continue to happen within the populations, you're going to have different populations evolving. Now, some of those populations will go extinct, like we saw in the horse example and the human example. Some of them won't make it as the environment changes. Others will continue to change over time. Others will stay the same because the environment stays the same and where they live. Others will survive because as the environment changes, they still have enough tolerance to withstand those environments. Well, whatever happens, some will go extinct, some will survive, new will show up. These changes will continue over millions and millions of years. And eventually, you're going to get species selection where some will go extinct and new come up. And that will lead to adaptive radiation and the formation of all different life forms. Now remember, it's hard to understand that, but if you're willing to accept that a species can become different species, and we saw several examples of that throughout the lecture series, you have to accept the concept that it's possible then that those species came from other species. So the idea is, if one species can become two, become isolated and change into different species, those two can become two, and those two can become two, and before you realize, you have branching out of the tree of life. But if this branching out, you can understand how it can go forward, you also can reverse that back in time and see this kind of thing happen, where all life on Earth, through changes, which may be either sudden or slow, through this process that we just described, as the environment is changing throughout time, as the uh, Earth changes, geology, uh, climate, all the different changes are taking place, as the biotic and abiotic factors of the environment changes, all life is going to go through this divergence process. And little by little, one life form, two, four, eight, sixteen, exploding into the tree of life. Given four billions of life, four billion years of history of life, is in four billion years of different environments across time and space, it is easy to understand why there is so much biodiversity in life. That's macroevolution. Doesn't happen very fast. But we have seen it 
because some species have very short generations. So we can see that happening in a small scale. Uh, and we saw evidence of that we did on this lecture series. And I hope you learn a lot. And I hope you don't do anything that would not make your mama proud.